morning, as we continue through Matthew, we've come up to chapter 11. And it took me a few minutes to come up with the title for this one. And unfortunately, the, by the title itself, does not give to be a very um, promising outlook for chapter 11 here. But we're going to kind of jump around a little bit and see how we get to this one about rejecting Christ. You know, we obviously know that not everybody that heard Christ believed on him and did all that he did. Uh, they didn't um, necessarily take and uh, start following him. And I guess that should not be a surprise to us because as we look through the Old Testament, we look through the nation of Israel, we look at mankind in general, how many times do, did mankind as a whole fall away from God? Even when the prophets would come or something would happen and say, hey, come back to God, did it really happen? And not always did. So for it to happen to Christ as well is disappointing, but yet still happens. And it's part of human nature. So as we remember what has happened in our timeline so far in the uh, book of Matthew, as Christ has been going around, we know that Christ has been teaching We've seen his baptism back in uh, chapter 3. We saw him go into the wilderness, uh, be tempted of the devil. We saw him give Matt from 5 through 7 the first sermon that we have recorded. Of Now, he'd been doing teachings and stuff before that, but the first big sermon. We've seen uh, hints and different uh, sections in here about people that he's healed and even brought back from the dead. And in the last chapter, he has trained up his disciples well enough and long enough that he has felt comfortable with letting them go on their own out to the different cities. So he's been doing this for some time. He's been building it, uh, the momentum up, if you will. And now we're at this point here where we think about people rejecting him. Why would he not be accepted? This man named Jesus, uh, who is bringing such a following everywhere he goes, there are, we always read of the crowds, we read of the numbers. He has such a powerful message that people acknowledge that, you know, especially after the we see after the um, Sermon on the Mount that he comes back and the people say they were amazed because he taught as one having authority. We also see the uh, description of how people have faith in him and believe in him and so much belief that they only say, all you have to do is say it, and I know it will happen. So we have people of great faith that believe in him. All of this miraculous is such a bonus to it. Why would he not be accepted? Well, first, to be, before we can reject him, we have to know what is, the, what is it that Christ is offering us? What is it he is promoting or giving us, uh, giving us the opportunity for? So we look towards the last portion of chapter 11, and we see kind of the conclusion of some of the chapter, but yet we see what it is that he's holding in his hand and letting people be known is here. So as we start looking at chapter 11, verse 25, at, the, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for it seemed good in your sight. The first thing we see here is like when Jesus makes this focus here, he has a respect and reverence towards God. He calls him Father and Lord, even Christ, who is the Son of God, who is part of the Godhead, is respecting and revering God the Father in the appropriate ways here as well. We see that there is something that has not been just given out completely until this point. Because he says that, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to the babes. Now, we're not necessarily talking just in the sense of who has the best uh, uh, IQ standard of the time and who is the youngest in the group. You know, we're not talking about babes of that nature. Look at the 
look at what this means and how you can take it. Those who are wise and prudent, what is a mean of controlling people? Power. Power comes from knowledge and understanding. Who in this time, we have to put ourselves back to the time frame of Christ, the, the words of the Old Testament, the words of the prophecy, all of this were written on scrolls. That was a very expensive process. To They didn't have a copy machine. We had to, someone had to read it, someone, and then others had to write it. You had to know how to write. You had to be educated to that. And that was a very controlled thing is the, the scrolls were kept inside the temple, inside an area for just certain people. So the common knowledge was not very common. All we knew if we were back in that time and were not one of the priests or one of those that had that power, the wisdom is whatever they told us. So when Jesus takes and criticizes the scribes and the Pharisees for what they're doing, they're standing up on the corner telling people how to be while not living the life themselves. Now if all we did was sit there and listen to what they said, they were not always saying things in error. We just had to make sure we didn't connect what we saw and what we heard together. If we did, we might start questioning what they were doing, which would not have been a bad thing. But he says to, those, to the babes, to those who are humble, to those who are willing to accept and to share. Not only do we receive things, but do we also, as adults, how much do we share our toys? Do we really share our toys freely and openly? When, like, but when we were a little kid, we would share toys around. We may have left the house with one toy and came back with another one, and someone else went home with ours. Maybe not always. But, um, but yet, by the end of it, we, we would play together. We would share together. You know, when it comes to today, what do we do? So the idea of that humbleness... You know, when we keep on looking, we see the idea of what was revealed. So what is it that he's talking about that, has been, that was hidden from the wise and prudent but given to the babes? We see that in 27, all things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one whom the Son wills to reveal him. So we have something very important here. We have the idea that, you know, obviously the Father and the Son are very close. They built the world. They have set all things in motion. The Son is now here. But he also says, you can see the Father. All things have been given to the Son. And the Son says, I am here to reveal it to as many as will look to as many as will see it. He says in 28, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we look at the take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy, his teachings. He is trying to teach us about God. Through his teachings, we see God through him. So his idea of no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone the Son chooses to tell about. And Jesus was not very picky about who he was talking to. He was criticized many times for being with the tax collectors, the sinners, for the people that are, ugh, they are not the right people. Christ said they are exactly the people that need to see the Father. They are the people so that they can change their ways. If we never go to the people that are doing wrong and try to bring them up, will they ever be brought up? Christ said, the scribes and the Pharisees, y'all have had enough time in the, in the scrolls, you've had the education, and you choose not to open your eyes. And you're also not opening your mouth in the right way to share that information, so I'm doing it for you. We're sharing this information. He's revealing himself to everyone. 
This is the offer that Christ gives. Take my information. Learn of me. By learning of me, you learn of the Father. All of whom the Son will reveal. How many times, and I may be getting ahead of myself here, but how many times does Christ say, He who has an ear, let him hear. He's leaving that up to us. He's leaving it up to the people of this generation that he's talking to, these massive crowds. If you want the information, here it is. I am giving it to you. How do we get that information? He's giving us the offer. That's the offer. The offer is to know God the Father, is to know the Son, is to be able to go through this process. How does he do it? Well, he does it by teaching. In verse 28, it says, come to me. If we want our education in the school system today, we have to go to school. And whatever means that is, if it's homeschool, if it's going to K-12, uh, college, university, in order to get that piece of paper that says you have accomplished this task, we have to go and accomplish that task. To get the teachings, to get the understanding and the knowledge, Christ says, come to me. That involves us getting up and going to where he is. Today, that involves us opening up the scriptures and reading what he has to say. For them back there, it meant they actually had to go and listen to what he had to say. Which is that second part, is that we have to listen to it. Verses 29 and 30, for my uh, learn of me, for he is gentle and lowly in heart. And by learning, we will find rest, maybe not physically. It may not just listening to the words that he has to say will not cure our ailments. It will not take us off the prayer list for the different issues we're having in life. But it will help us find rest for our souls. What better thing to do than know the Father? i can tell you one more better thing. Instead of just knowing the Father... How about knowing what it is to be pleasing to him so we can do it? That's what Christ is trying to tell them. Don't just know that it is good to you know, not murder somebody else, but it's also better and pleasing to God that we help everybody to the best of our ability. Take that extra step. Understand and learn it. And he says, my burden is light. He calls it easy and light. It is not a burdensome thing. It's not like trying to carry the cross uh, from after having been tortured all the way up that you know that you're about to get nailed to it. It's not that kind of a difficult thing. It's allowing ourselves to be, like he said in verse 25, being delivered and revealed to babes. Are we humble enough to just open ourselves to the word, to receive it with that meekness, to open ourselves to let it transform us into righteousness to God. For the people of that time, he also had a method of, you know, we said he has been doing great things, great works, mighty things. So those are done to get our attention. As we look back at some of this in verse 4 and 5, he says, you know, John the Baptist was in prison because he stood for God. He stood for what was right and told someone, you're not supposed to have her as your wife. She's not yours. She's already someone else's. And that was not a popular thing to do. And so he's been thrown in prison. He starts to waver in his que or he questions, as many did at the time of Christ. They weren't sure, was, was this an earthly kingdom that Christ, Christ was bringing? Was it a spiritual one? Was it, are you the one? was John's question. He sent his, some of his disciples to Christ and asked, and Jesus answered him and said in verse 4, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. They had a benefit of that time. They had the benefit of seeing what's in verse 5. The blind can see, the lame can walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf can hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Out of all that list, perhaps that last one is probably one of the better ones to think about. How much have the poor been oppressed? How much, even today, if we think about society, if you have, then you have. If you don't, then you don't. 
How much do the people that have really care about the people who don't? Unfortunately, that percentage is not high enough. It was no different back then. We still had that issue. Look at what is happening. Jesus is not just preaching to the elites. He is preaching to anyone that will listen. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And so they departed back. When we think about it, they were given that miraculous. We had this whole list of things. These are things that you don't just get healed from. These are things that are not disputable. A person with leprosy, you know it. A person de uh, who was blind from birth, they knew it. These things, if you're dead, we know it. These things are not just things that we see on the TV today saying, Ooh, I've got this terrible headache, and oh, it's miraculously gone. No. These are verifiable. These are very upfront and visible things. He says, not only tell them what you hear, but what you see. I see this as a great leader, too, looking at Jesus himself. He says, don't just, he didn't just tell them, yeah, I'm him. He said, look at the evidence. Look at what's being done. Let my actions and the words that I'm using daily speak for themselves instead of giving that you know, upfront answer that could be true or not. When someone does something great for us, do we appreciate it or do we take advantage of it? When we look at this list in five, the blind, the lame, the lepers, the deaf, the dead, the poor, all having these great things done for them. Do we appreciate that? Do we call up our friends and say, hey, come over here. You've got to listen to this guy. Or do we take advantage of what's going on? He invites us in. Christ is inviting us. He openly teaches to all, regardless of status or location. You know, the point in the last of five, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Why was Christ criticized so many times for preaching and associating with the sinners? With those that, if, you, if I go by them, I have to go cleanse myself. I have to go take a bath because it's too dirty to walk on the same streets as them. Do the scribes and Pharisees not hear themselves when they say this? But it goes back to one of the parables we've studied on Wednesday night about, you know, the Good Samaritan. How the priest, how the, um, the people that should be reaching out went across the street to go past this person instead of helping. They should have been the ones to help. They're the ones preaching it, but they weren't doing it. Unfortunately, I think some were just taking advantage of the situation. But look up the phrase. In this, in this particular section of chapter 11, it's verse 15. He who has an ear, let him hear. It's an open invitation. How many times through the writings of the gospel do we see that phrase? As we look through it, think about that when we see that phrase. Now, in this chapter, I only found it the one time. But look at some of these areas when he was, especially the Sermon on the Mount. He who has an ear, let him hear. He is saying something of great importance. He is giving us that invitation that I am trying to give you what you need for an eternity. But think about it too. Christ is the King of kings. He is the Son of God. He is going to be the ruler, is the ruler. How many kings have their door open that say, come to me at any time? Here he says, he who has an ear, let him hear. Well, the king doesn't just open up his audience to anybody, at least in that day and time. How many of us could get an invitation into the Oval Office? How many of us can take and just go to the governor's office and walk right in? Now, there may be times that some people can, but Christ is walking the streets saying, Come, listen to me. 
Here he says in 15, he who has an ear, let him hear. He also says towards that, the end there, we've already uh, covered it before, but he says, come to me. And who does he say? He says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. He's willing for all to come. He is inviting all to come. He is saying, come, listen, receive what I have because I give it to you freely. But as the title of the sermon suggests, not all people are accepting of this item. Not everybody accepts it and is willing to receive it, so much so that he says in verses 16 through 19, But to what shall I liken this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their companions and saying, We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We mourned you, and you didn't lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. When we look at this idea right here, if we dig into it and look, it is like children sitting in the marketplace. One group says, come, let's play, and the other says, no. Hey, let's try this, and the other group says, no. Christ, they're, they're crying out saying, we're looking, we're waiting for our Savior. We've read the text. We know he's coming. He's got to be coming soon. It's been a couple hundred years since our, the last prophet. We're waiting for him. And when he shows up, they say, well, we're not going to play with you. You wanted someone to listen to. You wanted what was coming, and then when, they, when he gets there, you cross your arms and sit down and pout, is what he is describing. Then he looks at the physical characteristics. When they looked at John the Baptist, they looked at him. He didn't come eating and drinking. He wasn't the social butterfly. He was out in the wilderness, and they said, oh, well, he's got a demon. He's not social like we are. So then Christ came. He's social. He's going to the things that they're going to. He's going where all the people are. Oh, look at how off he is. Look at what he's doing. They wouldn't accept anybody that was coming, bearing the name of God, saying the kingdom is coming. John said the kingdom is at hand. You know, it is coming. Christ is now. The kingdom is at hand. They didn't want to play with either one of them. Oh, he doesn't fit our norms. Oh, he's over here. Oh, he's social. Well, but he's doing this over here. They won't listen. Then in verses 20 and beyond through 24, we see a couple of cities that are uh, marked. And as we think about the way that Christ would move around and it would go from city to city, would sit and dwell within them, would teach them for a period of time, before moving to the next, he would look at them. How dangerous is this? A couple of these cities I'm not entirely familiar with, but you know, looking at them, we can see some information from them, but we get to one set of cities that we know very well. And very dangerous is that one, and how big of a uh, wake-up call should this have been? As we look, starting in verse 20, then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. What did he, you know, looking at the Old Testament, they would, a prophet would go to a city. They would preach to that city. They would either repent or they wouldn't. And Christ did most of his mighty works in some of these cities, and the city would not wake up. Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for the mighty works which are done in you, if they had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and, ash, sackcloth and ashes. The second set of cities, he wasn't in that one doing all of this mighty work, but he said if he had, he wouldn't have even gotten as far as he did before they had such a humbleness 
and such a response that they would have put on sackcloth and ashes. That's not a comfortable thing to be wearing. That's not a great thing to do. But we do see in times past where they would have done that because they were severely pricked in their hearts and said, we need to do something now. It is also going to be a visual thing. We need to show that our focus to getting right, and that was something that they did. And then he hits the next set. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And in verse 23, And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. Christ spent a lot of his time there in Capernaum. Capernaum was a big city in that time, very popular with trade, a very good location. He has spent a lot of time and effort with them. For the mighty works which were done here had been done in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. And we know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. We look at those where they were utterly destroyed because they couldn't find ten people that were righteous within the cities. Lot and his family barely got out and they didn't even all make it across the field. Christ said, if I had been in Sodom doing the things that I've done here, that city, that completely wicked city, would have still been standing today. How bad should that catch our attention? If they have rejected Christ that much, that they have seen his good works, they have heard his teaching, everything else, and he says that Sodom, that wicked, complete, utter, destroyed city, would still be alive today if he had been there to teach of some of what he did? That should be a wake-up call. Amen. But I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. And there's another sobering fact to think about in the responses that we give to the gospel. What is it that we see? What do we give? When we learn of it, do we follow Christ? For there will be a judgment because he gives us those cities. He gives us definition more tolerable will be for this group than this one. There's going to be degrees of punishment. Now getting into all the details of that, I'm leaving that to Christ in the final judgment and that's on them. My idea is I don't want to be in that group of people. I'd rather be the group that goes back to John in the earlier um, verses and says, I've seen this, I've seen this, I've seen this, I've heard this, I've heard about this. This is what's being said. This is what's being done. Where is our focus? What is it that we are doing with the information we're provided? Unfortunately, by rejecting Christ, we reject the Father and the Father's the one who created all this and for us in the first place. Amen. The other sad part is if we reject now, we lose the ability to be able to have that rest for our souls. Why is Christ spending all of his time and effort? Because he is gentle and lowly in heart, he's humble, he cares. And he wants us to find rest for our souls. He wants us to have that. That's why he ended this, his section there. He ended it with the invitation. I want you to pick up my, my yoke because it is not burdensome. It is easy to do. He brings us the opportunity to be one with the Father, to know him, to know what it is to be pleasing to him. He has demonstrated himself through his teachings and through the miracles that he gave, through all that he has done, all the way through to his death on the cross and the resurrection afterwards. He freely gives to anyone who is willing. The question is, will we be one of those who when we hear the words, he who has an ear, let him hear, will we listen? And when we listen to the point of not just following around so we can get the freebies that come along with it of our, uh, uh, of our uh, issues being healed, but is it that we are following him 
to gain that knowledge, that information that will lead us to eternity. I don't want to think about being compared to the city of Sodom. I don't want to be compared of trying to figure out who's going to be worse in punishment, me or Sodom. I want to avoid that conversation altogether. Christ says, come to me. With that invitation, I don't think any better invitation can be given. Christ gives us the invitation. If there are any that need to respond to the invitation today, we offer it as we sing the song. It can be if you, know, if you have the need to start listening to Christ, to start accepting those teachings and to fully obey them. If it's that we've stumbled away and we need to return back, as long as we are alive and breathing, we have the opportunity to follow Christ. We need to follow him now so that he may take and lighten our burden and bring joy to our souls. We can do this through Christ. If anyone has need of the invitation, for whatever reason, please come while together we stand and sing.